biomedical science take time. I know a lot of you in here know that for a fact. Uh, especially to take a lab finding and the process of taking that lab finding into actual use in medicine. It's a very long process. And sometimes you get disturbed when you see people on television say, we have found this and this, this works. And then they ask, how long, long time will that take before we see it in the hospitals? Well, 10, 15, 20 years, they say. This is true. And this is not usually the scientists that make the discovery that will take this all the way to a product and to something that works in medicine. But I think for our students that we teach today, that we teach biomedical science and medicine, it's really important to know when you see an experiment, whether that experiment has the potential to actually become something that could be used in medicine. And that is possibly why a lot of people actually are working with biomedical science, because that is one of the goals. Of course, other goals is just to find out how things work. So, I will start with just go very briefly through the process of doing science. So, science usually starts with questions. Those could be questions about uh, why, how, how does things work? And you make an hypothesis, then you set up experiments, and you make observations. Those observations lead to results and eventually to discoveries. You find out how things work. You get a proof of your hypothesis. Sometimes you get the proof of a concept that this thing actually works. In that process, it's not uncommon that you make inventions. You design assays, you design methods that actually are new to make these findings. And then you're at that stage, if you're some researchers, that will form new questions, you start this again. But then you can realize that this might be so good, this result, so this could actually be used. Is there any use? And to start looking at these steps towards how should I make this discovery into something that could be used, that I think requires some new thinking that we have to introduce in the teaching of our students. And I will try to exemplify this process by talking about my favorite friends, carbohydrates because this is my research field. So those carbohydrates that I work with are not connected at all with carbohydrates that we eat. Carbohydrates are present in our body at all cells. They're connected to proteins, they're connected to lipids, and actually, if you would have been a very small particle approaching a cell surface, the only thing you would see is a forest of carbohydrates. The cell surface would be completely covered with these complex structures, a little bit like this nice carpet that I'm standing on. Uh, also, uh, carbohydrates are attached to proteins that it gets secreted from cells. Of course, anything in the body that will approach a cell or attach to a cell would encounter carbohydrates. So we know now that immune cells that will attach to each other during an immune response, they use carbohydrate interactions. We also know that almost all bacteria and viruses attach to cells via carbohydrate interactions to be able to infect cells. So carbohydrates have a lot of functions in the body. And also the area that I'm studying is that the carbohydrate structures are very diverse and very specific to each cell type. But if there is a change in the environment, the cell rapidly uh, changes their carbohydrates on the surface. 
make new structures. And over 30 years ago, uh, it was found that all cancer cells actually express different carbohydrate structures on their surfaces that compared to normal cells. They also secrete proteins uh, with other carbohydrates that reflect the carbohydrates of the cancer cells. So, that was a discovery. Question, can we make something that could detect the cancer proteins and uh, differentiate those from the normal proteins? So we started to work with this in our lab uh, and we used a lectin. And lectins are carbohydrate binding proteins. And we found a carbohydrate binding protein, a lectin, from a mushroom called orange peel mushroom, which has a specificity that presumably would bind those carbohydrates. We tried that experiment. It bound carbohydrates, but unfortunately it bound both the cancer type and the normal type. New question. That lectin, as you can see, it has several arms. It was a very complicated molecule. Could we rearrange that or make it more specific towards the cancer-specific carbohydrates? And actually, now I, I realized when coming to this meeting that we actually used synthetic biology. I didn't know. But we deconstructed the protein by using a smaller DNA sequence uh, adding and doing something with that DNA sequence. So we got a smaller mini lectin that only contained one binding site that we supposed to be more specific towards the cancer type of carbohydrates. And as you can see in this very good slide here, yes, it only bound the cancer type carbohydrates. This is actually an invention. We did this, it worked, it's a completely new protein, it's an invention. So, proof of concept, does this work in reality? So, then we used, it seems that this protein is secreted into plasma, into blood, you can take a blood sample from patients. We did an assay where you add this mini lectin to the assay to detect these carbohydrate specific carbohydrate changes. And then could you see this in patients? And there we followed a lot of patients that actually had hepatitis B with a higher risk of forming cancer. And we could see that we got a very big signal in exactly those patients that developed cancer. This is liver cancer model. This is where you get the interview when someone says, okay, can you get this to the clinic? No, because this is a first proof of concept and there is a long way. So what we have to teach students now, I think, is how do you think when you start developing something that might be used in a later stage. And there are a lot of things to consider. And one of the models uh, that has been used a lot uh, for marketing studies, when you have a product, will this product sell? I think that could be very useful in this stage as well, of checking whether your assay, whether your concept, whether your approach, would be applicable for something that later could be used. So what you do is you look at your approach, that is your assay, this is what we have. And then you say, is this approach good enough? Does it fit the criteria of those other things? And the first thing you look at is the need. Is there anybody that will need this assay? Who will need this assay? Well, the patients, of course, that there is a need, but the ones that really need the assay are the clinicians performing the analysis. And then you have to ask yourself, should you perform the analysis on everyone in the world to detect liver cancer, or should we perform it on just 
some single population, some risk population, you have to define where is the big need for an assay like this. Of course, the you probably need for the assay to be performed in hospital labs. So then you can think, is our assay good enough to be sent to a hospital lab? Are the reagents stable enough? Could you actually perform the assay somewhere else? Do we have to redefine our assay system so it can be used in other labs? Next thing is to look at benefit per cost. And this is really to say, uh, is uh, the assay relevant at all? Uh, does it have a benefit over a cost? And the cost could be time, effort, or actual money cost. Say that the need is to analyze 1,000 patients a day, and our assay takes one day to perform one analysis. Then there is no benefit over the cost in time. So then you have to go back to your approach, redefine the approach, say we need an assay that can actually do thousand samples during a day. Uh, are the reagents cheap enough? Uh, if the assay costs a thousand pounds a day, or, or per kit, that will not be a benefit. Then, then that will affect the need. The last thing to consider is competition. Are there alternatives? There might be other alternatives that will fit, fit better into need, benefit, and so on. And if you find that Okay, here we have a competition uh, with, that our assay is not better, but for this application, our assay is better. Then you know where to focus your assay. So fine, if you find that all this fits in, you can actually start to develop a new proof of concept that will actually be much easier to put into an application. This takes time, but this also takes a lot of creativity and it's a new way of thinking of data. It might also be so that you find that it doesn't fit at all. But still, you have made an invention. I have a mini lectin. Maybe I can use it for something else that will fit in. And you will go back and think. And if you remember what I said, Six minutes ago, bacteria binds to carbohydrate surfaces very specifically. Maybe we can use the mini-lectin to block bacteria. And then we have a whole new application. Okay, we have to do some new experiments. Take the steps all again. But I think working with both these approaches of regular basic science and also some kind of application science can actually spin the thoughts in uh, science, scientific thinking to be more creative. And we have started, uh, the last thing was that everything is connected. Uh, we have started now at the biomedical education to put this into practice, so we teach our students to think this way, to start working with our own project, and this has been very successful. The students like this application thinking. I think it's very dangerous to say that you should only start with an application when you form your questions, but doing both the basic science and combine it with some kind of application science, I think can make students more flexible and data better, and finally we can put things to use. And also, I like to say, don't forget that the world is filled with complex carbohydrates. We know very little about them, so there's a huge field and a lot of things to be discovered. Thank you very much.